Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our first ocular melanoma patient caregiver symposium day one. Um, my name is Jasmine. I am the managing director here at Saver Skin Foundation. And I will go ahead and introduce our host for today in just a moment. But before I do, I just want to go over a few housekeeping Zoom rules with you all today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I hope you can see the screen fine floor to our very own Kathy Bernard. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, so we're now going to start our symposium. My name is Kathy Bernard, and I am the founder and president of the Save Your Skin Foundation, and I would probably say co-creator of Ocumel Canada. In 2003, I was diagnosed with stage 4 malignant melanoma, by the time I had established Save Your Skin in 2006, my cancer had spread to my vital organs and my treatment options were limited. Fortunately, one of my sons discovered an immunotherapy trial uh, taking place in the U.S. and we were able to get that treatment into Alberta, Canada for me. This trial saved my life. This year marks my 20th anniversary since my battle with cancer. And while my cancer treatments have finished, the battle with melanoma is never over. Here at Save Your Skin Foundation, we are a patient-led organization dedicated to the fight against non-melanoma skin cancers, melanoma, and ocular melanoma through education, advocacy, and awareness initiatives right across this beautiful country. Save Your Skin Foundation provides a community of oncology patient and caregiver support throughout the entire continuum of care, from prevention and diagnosis to survivorship. Now, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors who generously made our symposium possible. Medicine Immunocore, Castle Biosciences, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Merck, Pfizer. I'd also like to thank them for their support and um, for all the support they've given us throughout this year. Finally, I would like to pass on the mic to my very good friend, Nigel Deacon. Nigel? Hello, everyone. My name is Nigel Deacon, and I live in Victoria on Vancouver Island. Thank you so much for joining our first ever Canadian Ocular Melanoma Patient and Caregiver Symposium, a very proud moment for Save Your Skin Foundation and Ocumel Canada. We hope you will learn a lot from our two days of sessions about various aspects of this disease. I was diagnosed with ocular melanoma in June 2010. I had absolutely no symptoms and was diagnosed completely by accident. It was a big shock to me, as I am sure it is to all patients. I asked at the time if my disease would be tracked by scanning and was told there was no point as nothing could be done about it if it spread. I worked hard at not thinking any more about it and getting on with my life. However, in March 2012, just under two years later, I had some inexplicable severe pain. I went to emergency where a CT scan revealed that the disease had indeed spread to several parts of my body. I was even more shocked to hear the same message again at that time. There is nothing to be done. Just make your arrangements. I'm a fighter. No was not a good answer for me. I fought my way to several treatments through the next four years. And by some unexplained miracle, the disease went to sleep and remains asleep 11 years after diagnosis of metastatic disease. My next MRI is on April the 26th. In the beginning, I did not know anyone with the disease. I looked hard, I looked everywhere, but I was alone. Online, I found some groups in the States that were organizing and I built friendships with them. Several years later, that formed the basis for the creation of Ocumel Canada. I had, in the meantime, met Kathy Bernard, 
the legend of cutaneous melanoma in Canada. She could remember being in a similar position many years earlier. A revolution in treatments for cutaneous melanoma occurred between 2010 and 2015, but Kathy was well aware it still looked very different for ocular melanoma patients. We put our heads together and Ocumel Canada officially emerged in January 2019. We had been doing the groundwork together for two years already, and much has happened since then. We're going to be hearing a lot about that positive change over the next two days. To start us off, I would like to introduce you to Sherry Agresti. Sherry is a proud Newfoundlander who has worked 37 years in the IT industry. She's looking forward to this summer to celebrate her 30th wedding anniversary, her daughter's 19th birthday, and her son's 21st birthday. Sherry enjoys traveling abroad when possible, but spends most summer weekends at the RV park in the family trailer with a little kayaking on the pond. She used to be an avid curler, but is more of a curling fan these days. Sherry is active in the ocular melanoma community and tries to help newly diagnosed omies where she can. Sherry? Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Nigel and Kathy. Uh, just want to confirm that you can hear me. Yes. Okay, thanks. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my microphone, so we'll, we will progress and see where it leads. Uh, but thank you, Nigel and Kathy, for those words of welcome. I'm honored to have been invited to present here today and to help organize this event. As was mentioned already, uh, this is the first Canadian patient and caregiver symposium focused on ocular melanoma, and it was very important to us as organizers to make sure that we included the voice of people living with this disease. As you know, this is a rare cancer and it can be a very lonely experience. So I'm honored to have been asked to kick off day one of the symposium by sharing my story as a person living with primary ocular melanoma. So my story begins in Western Newfoundland where I grew up in a city of 25,000 residents. We had one ophthalmologist who is still practicing there today, many years later. I started wearing glasses when I was in grade three, but my sight was still pretty good. Uh, my mother had poorer vision and was declared legally blind when I was in junior high. Because of that, she insisted her children see an ophthalmologist regularly. I feel that her persistence helped to preserve some of my sight as my ocular melanoma was detected through ongoing annual exams. I don't know how long I had a nevus in my right eye, but I was first told about it after I moved to St. John's to go to university. I was told it could turn to cancer, but my understanding was the risk was low, so luckily I didn't stress about it over all those years in between. I remember, um, funny, funny story, um, before ocular photography and ultrasounds were available in Newfoundland, uh, one of my ophthalmologists used to look into the dilated eye and draw a picture of my nevus on a cue card and put it in his filing cabinet. Then on the next visit, we would ex uh, he would examine my eye and compare the nevus to the drawing that he kept on file. I'm so glad that technology has made the science much more accurate today. So for 30 years, uh, 30 plus years at each visit, to check the nevus, I was told there was no change and I went merrily along my way. But that changed in my 50s when I was told that the nevus hadn't changed much. That concerned me and we discussed what would happen if the nevus grew. The doctor said I would go to Toronto for radiation treatment, most likely. So I googled OM at that time, but I didn't get research in depth. Um, and after that appointment, I was seen more frequently uh, for a year or so, but there didn't seem to be any marked changes or uh, anything worrying. So we went back to the regular annual visits. Um, the week that changed everything started on a high as I had returned from vacation with some friends. I had an optometrist appointment on Monday. All my appointments happened to be together. Uh, and I expected at that appointment that I would need a new prescription uh, because my sight seemed slightly worse, although I thought it was more just farsightedness with age. And the other symptom that I had that I had been ignoring 
was occasional sharp pains in my right eye. Uh, I was surprised when the optometrist said there was no real change in my eyesight, but that left me, I think, more worried about seeing the ophthalmologist that Wednesday. And that day, when I had my uh, ophthalmology appointment, the routine was normal with, uh, you know, your eye chart, uh, eye dilation, uh, photographs taken, right up until the part where the ophthalmologist uh, would come in to do the ultrasound and discuss my photos. And that was the first time that um, in the years that I was uh, seeing him, that he didn't shake my hand when he walked into the room. And I felt then there was something wrong. Uh, he gave me the results of the photos and the scans. And there was a one plus millimeter growth, which is not huge, but the previously it was only around two millimeters, so it was it was a large growth. It was about one and a half, I think, millimeters. And there were other indicators of melanoma as well. So even though I was somewhat prepared, uh, I was still shocked, and sadly, I was there by myself to get that bad news. Uh, he uh, doctor said that I would go to Toronto to be formally diagnosed, um, but I was pretty sure myself that his pre-diagnosis was correct. So I, uh, I googled, of course, uh, like you, uh, like you shouldn't, uh, but I did Google that night, and that was when I discovered how you know how deadly the disease can be. And that was in November 20th of 2019. Uh, my appointment at Princess Margaret was scheduled for December 17th, which seems fairly quick, but my referral letter took 12 days to be sent and a number of phone calls and even a visit in person to the ophthalmology office to say, please, when are you going to send my referral? Uh, so uh, December 17th, uh, flying up to Toronto for the appointment was pretty surreal. And I think there are some days even now when I have to shake myself about having a rare cancer. Uh, my diagnosis at Princess Margaret was swift. Uh, I was told by 10.15 a.m. that morning that they were 99% sure that it was ocular melanoma. Dr. Krema's team took their time and explained things in detail, answered all my questions. Uh, I think the experience was tougher on my husband than on me as he was still holding out hope that it wasn't cancer. Uh, going into that appointment, I was concerned about losing my eye big with all the unknowns, and I was relieved that when I was told it could be treated with plaque brachytherapy. Uh, my, my tumor was considered on the small side of medium and not near the optic nerves, so the doctors were optimistic with the, with the outcome. Uh, the nurses and the doctors were fantastic, uh, and because I was coming from out of province and scheduled to fly out later that day, uh, my pre-op tests were completed, papers were signed, I had a visit with the radiologist, all within a few crazy hours, really, um, but they, uh, they did treat me very well. Between um, my diagnosis and my treatment, which was on January 2nd, 2020, I told very few people, and I didn't have a formal support group of any of any kind. Uh, I was thrilled uh, when I got to connect with the Canadian Face Group uh, Facebook group uh, later that year. Um, uh, around the same time, I also lost my longtime family doctor of 37 years, I believe. Uh, she retired late in November. Uh, I was stressed; my blood pressure was up, um, and um, Thankfully, she decided to uh, reach out to another physician and ask to, uh, that he take me on as a patient. Uh, and funny, sto funny story in a way about the plaque surgery was that I didn't fully understand the procedure uh, in advance. I, I know when I was Googling, a video came up, but I refused to watch that because I thought I would be totally freaked out uh, in advance, which wasn't necessary. Uh, I had read the materials provided and listened to the doctors. Uh, so I think it might have been a bit of a defense mechanism uh, on my part, but I truly believe that the plaque was going to be sewn on the outside of my eye and not on the inside of my eye. <laughs> so per perhaps I wasn't as stressed as, a, as I, uh, I would have been um, <clears throat> going into the surgery. I had a friend that traveled with me to Toronto for surgery. Uh, my teenagers were 15 and 17, and I thought that they probably needed my husband with them. Uh, and my friend was uh, good at looking after people who had had surgeries <laughs> in her past. Um, 
She didn't. Uh, she didn't fail to uh, tease me though, and uh, for all you Harry Potter uh, fans, uh, she referred to me more than once as Mad Eyed Moody uh, <laughs> as I was walking around with my patch on. Um, we we set off for Toronto uh, in the wee hours of New Year's Day. And I was the first surgery of the year. Uh, I received stellar care at Princess Margaret. And I was uh, very glad to stay in the hospital the first night overnight, as I did have some issues related to the anesthesia. My week um, with the plaque inserted wasn't bad, uh, except for fatigue and weakness from time to time. I did manage to get out and about in Toronto a little most days. And the night before plaque removal, my friend and I saw the Come From Away play that I had been looking forward to. And I flew home a day after the plaque removal surgery. Um, next slide, please. And my recovery from uh, the plaque re uh, surgery was very relatively easy compared to what I heard from some other folks. I know everybody has a, a fairly different experience. I had few issues, uh, just uh, miss my, with stitches and a little pain. Uh, my biggest problem was the stretching of the muscles uh, that occurred during the surgery. So the left side of my eye and below my eye. And uh, I had double vision, especially when looking down. And from a driving perspective, looking left uh, was a bit difficult for some time. I had double vision, uh, uh, especially when looking in those directions and when I woke up every morning for, for a little while. Uh, I had a little dizzy, dizziness and nausea, but just for a day or two. Um, and after a few weeks, I did start easing back into driving and work. Uh, but it did take a few months before things had settled fully. I was left with a blind spot uh, directly opposite to my tumor. So uh, right here, I can't see. Uh, but as it's on the edge of my vision, it's, uh, it doesn't, luckily, it doesn't cause me uh, much in the way of an issue. Um, so next, I would have received my biopsy uh, results for the... Um, indicating the tumor genetic mutations. Uh, I didn't hesitate with having the biopsy because uh, the more information I could receive, uh, the better for me. Uh, but I was expecting to get good news for some reason. Uh, I guess the nevus was, you know, was followed closely. The tumor wasn't large, but unfortunately uh, it did come back saying I had monosomy three, which has an additional risk of, uh, of spread. Um, and when I received the impact genetics report, I saw that I actually had isodisomy 3, which I hadn't heard of before that. Um, but it's supposed to have the same risk as monosomy 3. Uh, it's just slightly different in the genetics. Um, I tried to Google it and look a bit, bit of research, but uh, I didn't find a lot of information on the differences there. Um, and after receiving my uh, genetic report, I was referred by Dr. Krema's office to uh, be a patient of Dr. Butler, uh, who continues to follow me to monitor the spread for, uh, you know, can for cancer spread. I'm very thankful for such a wonderful team of experts at, at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Uh, after that, of course, I moved on to having surveillance. And when I had my initial scans, I wasn't terribly worried, as I had read that a very low percentage of folks show, showed metastasis at the time of diagnosis. The worry, you know, has increased a little bit over time, but I try not to focus on it for any length of time. I continue with uh, lung uh, CTs every year and liver MRIs every six months, and there has been nothing worrying, nothing really worrying uh, that has showed to date. Um, my scans are done locally in St. John's, and then the um, images are also sent to Princess Margaret for analysis. I do find that the local testing isn't smooth, and I often have to make calls to ensure that the appointments are being scheduled. Uh, I had a recent ophthalmologist change as well, which didn't help. Um, and there's always a time lag to get results. So that does add unneeded stress, in my opinion. I, uh, I was returning to Toronto for ocular oncology visits every six months, but this has now been extended to yearly visits uh, now that the tum tumor is considered dead. I also have regular virtual appointments with Dr. Butler. 
I do have some concerns about radiation retinopathy. Um, growing up with a parent who was legally blind, I know too well the challenges of the poorly sighted. Uh, thus far, my exams, examinations have shown uh, some cotton wool spots around the retina, uh, some minor blood vessel issues, and some fluid, uh, which I understand are early signs of radiation retinopathy. The vision in that eye is definitely less sharp, but it's still it's still pretty good. It's relatively pretty good. Uh, I don't know how far the vision loss will progress, um, but I do have a great eye care center locally uh, who are capable of treating issues as they arise. I wanted to pass on something I read about ocular melanoma, um, which said that the goal of ocular oncology is first to save your life, then to save your eye, and then to save your sight. Um, I am thankful that I've, I've been lucky on the journey thus far, and I'm very hopeful that more tools will be found to treat the disease going forward. So that brings me to today. I am looking forward very much to hearing from our esteemed experts today and getting the latest news on ocular melanoma. This symposium is especially important as Canadian OM patients get to hear about Canadian research treatments and hopes going forward for the disease. I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ezekiel Weiss who will be presenting on ocular melanoma in the primary setting. Uh, though Dr. Weiss was unable to join us live today, he was kind enough to record his presentation for us. Uh, Dr. Weiss is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Alberta, clinical professor of surgery at the University of Calgary, provincial medical lead for the Alberta Ocular Brachytherapy Program, President of the Canadian Society of Oculoplastic and Reconstructive Surgeons. He's a graduate program director for the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Alberta. He's a fellowship director at Orbit Oculoplastics and Ocular Oncology at the University of Calgary. He's co-chair of the Ocular Melanoma Physician Task Force of Canada. Dr. Weiss has over 70 peer-reviewed publications, 10 chapter books, book chapters, sorry, <laughs> uh, 30 invited lectures, more than 100 research presentations, and many mentoring and teaching awards. I've heard Dr. Weiss speak at other symposiums in the past, and I'm very excited to hear his presentation today. We were able to get some questions from patients to Dr. Weiss, and he will answer them at the end of his presentation. Uh, Jasmine, you may now start the video. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present today and for the organizers for Prince. Uh, it's such an amazing uh, conference to uh, provide all of you more information on museal melanoma. Today, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the eye anatomy and how it relates to melanoma. And we want to understand the spectrum of melanocytic lesions. Melanocytic meaning tumors or lesions arising from the cell called the melanocyte. We want to understand the epidemiology of melanoma, recognize some common clinical features that us physicians look for when diagnosing patients. We're going to talk about the risk factors for growth of small melanocytic lesions that are often observed. Talk a bit about Alberta's protocol, which is very similar to many others that are used across the country and the world, and recognize the common treatment options. The anatomy of the eye, in terms of what we're discussing today, is going to focus on the area called the uvea, which consists of three structures, the choroid in the back, the ciliary body near the front, and the iris being the colored part of the eye that we see uh, surrounding the black people. Why are we discussing those three areas? And that type is because the neural crest-derived melanocytes, which can cause melanoma, live in these three structures and therefore melanomas can arise in these structures. It's important to um, emphasize that the melanocytic lesions or lesions inside the eye uh, made of uh, melanosomes or the cells that produce the pigment in our eyes is a spectrum of diseases where the one spectrum is the freckle, uh, technically known as the ophelis. The other side is the malignant melanoma, which uh, is obviously a cancer, and in the middle is a mole, otherwise known as a nevus. Uh, freckles have an increase in the number of melanosomes, or the little um, 
cell uh, bags that can contain a pigment within the cell, but no increased number of melanocytes, no increased number of cells. The mole or amoebas have an increased number of um, melanocytic cells, but they're not um, atypical enough that they're able to invade and destroy and spread to other parts of the body. And that's what happens when we transition from a mole to a melanoma as those cells now have uh, obtained those abilities to uh, destroy and spread to other parts of the body, forming a cancer. Uveal melanoma and cutaneous or skin melanoma are quite different and they have very different natural histories and behavior patterns. And one of the main reasons for that is the differences in the uh, mesoderm and ectoderm uh, as the um, layers uh, embryogenically where the cells arise from, as well as the media does not have the basic membrane or lymphatics, which allow us to assess levels of invasion and spread to lymphatics. Approximately 5 to 6 percent of the Caucasian population will have a nevus or a mole with, uh, in the eye that can be detected in the choroid. And this percentage goes down uh, depending on the darkness of the skin. So as the population you're studying um, uh, gets darker and darker, the frequency of moles goes down. Uh, fortunately for us as clinicians, the characteristics of nevi and melanoma are very similar. In people of all races, making diagnosis much uh, easier. Now, what's important to emphasize today is that the malignant transformation of a mole to a melanoma is a very uncommon situation. And approximately uh, one in five to six thousand moles will turn into a melanoma. So, fortunately, that means very few people get melanoma, despite about five to six percent of the population having a mole in their eye. Uh, the, what we call the incidence of melanoma, the number of new cases that occur every year are just typically described as six cases per one million person years in the white population. That means if you follow one million people for one year, you expect to see about six new cases of melanoma. In Alberta, we treat uh, the Alberta Saskatchewan and the Northwest Territory, as well as parts of British Columbia and Manitoba, and we see about 85 to 90 new cases of melanoma uh, per year. Dr. Crema, who will be speaking later, uh, runs the largest program in the country um, and has quite a larger um, population base that he treats. The most common location for melanoma in the eye is the choroid. The second most common location is the seri body, and the last is the iris. We talk a lot about uh, mortality with cancer, and um, many of you guys have read um, that the overall survival around 25 years is 50% for the entire group, um, and that there's been no change in survival in the last 30 years. These statistics are correct, but nowadays we provide much more information about the prognosis in which group you as an individual diagnosed with melanoma fall in. If some have an extremely low risk of metastasis and some have a very high risk. Um, and it's important now for us to not look at it as one group with an overall 50% survival because it's actually much better for uh, many people and um, that is more emotionally uh, less difficult uh, to absorb. But it is important to emphasize that uh, the current outcomes are not good enough and uh, many excellent people are working to improve outcomes for uh, people with uh, diagnosis melanoma. More detail can be found when we include size, small tumors, only 20% of people develop metastasis with very large tumors, about 67%. So you can see the importance of subcategorizing patients into different risk groups, as well as um, focusing on early treatment with small tumors to improve survival. As most of you know, the uh, metastasis, when they occur, most commonly go to the liver. Um, then much in a distant second is lung and bone. Um, so therefore, screening for metastasis really focuses on the liver. When I first started practicing in the kind of 2005-2008 range, the average survival at the time of diagnosis of metastasis was six months. Now it's closer to 18 months, 
We have many patients who live quite a bit longer than 18 months as well. So there are two key findings that I wanted to emphasize. One, our outcomes are not good enough and there have not been dramatic improvements in survival despite many advances in how we treat melanoma. Therefore, it's important to understand the cause or ideology to try to prevent melanoma as well as get the patient earlier when our tumors are smaller. The second point I wanted to emphasize that we talked about was that melanomas are common, I'm sorry, levi are common, but melanomas are rare. So therefore, it's very important for us as a um, specialty to find the characteristics that allow us to identify lesions when they're small and attempt to treat them earlier. I'm going to quickly touch on a question I get quite often is can we prevent uh, malignant melanoma? And that often right now uh, pushes us towards the question is can we, is ultraviolet light or sunlight exposure related to malignant melanoma? So it turns out when you look at the uh, literature, there's no consistent proven association found between ultraviolet light exposure and melanoma. This was the answer when I first started uh, assessing this association about 15 to 20 years ago. Um, how we do know a little bit more now. One of the tricky aspects of studying ultraviolet light and its causes of melanoma have to do with the ability of certain parts of the eye to block ultraviolet light and the fact that the UV being made up of three different tissues has different exposure to um, ultraviolet light. We'll take the iris first, and so light sunlight uh, comes through, it's the cornea, is attenuated by the cornea and strikes the iris. In contrast to choroid, light will come through, get attenuated by the cornea, as well as get attenuated by the lens, and then only this, the ultraviolet light that can get through both the cornea and the lens ends up striking the uh, choroid. The choroid is also tricky because we have a posterior choroid, and a anterior choroid, uh, where the anterior choroid gets much less light due to the iris blocking much of the light uh, heading to the periphery of the uh, choroid. And the ciliary body, our final structure, uh, is not expected to get any uh, ultraviolet light exposure at all due to the blockage of the ultraviolet light uh, by the iris itself. After age 24, the lens itself also becomes more opaque and blocks 100% of the ultraviolet B, the most commonly associated ultraviolet light with um, cancer. Um, so childhood exposure is likely to be more important than adult exposure if we do find an association in the future. The anatomy of the eye and what we, what we do in terms of what we air, uh, wear impacts things quite a, a great deal. The eyebrows, the eyelids, and the cheeks impact the amount of UV that hits the eye. In addition, some people wear contact lenses that have variable amounts of UV protection. Some people wear eyeglasses that have variable amounts of UV protection. Many people wear sunglasses and hats. And all of these things dramatically impact how much ultraviolet light hits the eye. It makes it difficult to study. Our group um, has uh, studied uh, quite a bit. Uh, about melanoma of the eye and ultraviolet light, and we have found an association with both aquatic welding and suntan beds, uh, but other forms of ultraviolet light uh, have not been uh, proven yet, and we, this work is still ongoing. Let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the clinical presentation of melanoma and the approach that physicians use in diagnosing melanoma. We'll start with the iris, which is near the front of the eye, that only accounts for all, only 8% of uveal melanomas. Here is a photograph of an iris melanoma, and they are more commonly inferior, like, it, like this uh, photograph shows. Uh, turns out in the iris, about 60% of the population will have a freckle, uh, nevus in 5% of the population, and interestingly enough, only 5% of the really suspicious looking moles in the eye ever show growth. So our approach to the iris monocytic region is that when they get sent to an ocular oncologist almost 99% of the time, we're going to label it as a nevus and observe. Only 1% of the time will we say, hey, this is a melanoma and we should go straight to treatment. 
5% of those that we observe and are suspicious will grow and then be labeled a melanoma. And then we can treat it uh, using eye wall resection or iridectomies or iridectomies as is shown in this uh, photo here. Colloidal lesions by far the most common represent 80% of all medial melanomas. Here is an example of a pigmented colloidal melanoma and the key structures that we can uh, focus on here are also the, um, here's the melanoma, the optic nerve, it sends a signal from the eye to the brain for your vision, and the fovea here. Here are some key uh, findings that we use um, to detect melanoma. Turns out the ocular oncologist is able to diagnose melanoma that's constantly different about 99.5% of the time without requiring bi uh, biopsy. This is but based on a constellation of findings. We look at the front of the eye, the endoscopy, the back of the eye, we study the ultrasound, and in some cases we use both an angiogram and rarely finding last breaking biopsy. Here are some examples of some sentinel vessels and you can see um, here that this vessel here is an example of a sentinel vessel and here are some other ones here and these are blood vessels that are feeding the tumor that we look for. Often we'll transilluminate light into the eye and look for a shadow as is seen here which uh, also provides more information as this being a melanoma. Inside the eye, you can see huge variations in pigmentation. On the um, left side of the screen are the very hypopigmented or very pale regions, such as this one. And in the middle, you see ones that have areas of dark pigmentation and areas of low pigmentation. Here is one that's medium pigmented and just around my image here we can see a heavily pigmented melanoma. Ultrasound is a very important aspect of looking for melanoma and we often look for these dome-shaped lesions that look hollow on the inside or show this depression on the A scan which is quite suggestive of melanoma. And then in rare cases what we'll order for the angiogram is to look at you know, injection dye in the blood vessels and take pictures of that dye as it enters uh, the tumor to differentiate melanoma from other causes. This is a non-pigmented version where we often see a double circulation pattern. And if, when necessary, we perform needle biopsies of the tumor to uh, assess the cells or the genetic components of the cells to get a diagnosis. Now I'm going to jump to ciliary body lesions, which account for approximately 12% of medial melanoma. Here is a picture of a ciliary body lesion. And the ciliary body hides just behind the iris, or the color part of the eye. So when we dilate the pupil, we could see this melanoma just behind the iris. So what do we do once we've confirmed that there's a choroidal melanocytic lesion? And we can know this is arising from the melanosome. Here is an example of what we do in Alberta from the Alberta Protocol. Uh, us, uh, for simplicity, we'll say it's less than three millimeters thick. We're going to call it a nevus, and then we observe it. And if it grows, we'll call we'll call it a melanoma and treat it. In reality, though, we divide the nevi into high risk versus low risk. In some high risk lesions, we might offer treatment early on. If the lesion is over three millimeters thick, then we label the melanoma and we treat it. Three treatment options include, I apologize, my, my image is sitting right above the one of the words there, which says the section, when we actually go in and cut out the tumor, we can use radiation, such as brachytherapy, and then if the tumor is very large, uh, we often will use a nucleation or eye removal. The COM study, which is a huge, large, multi-institutional randomized controlled trial performed in the 80s and 90s, had two main studies. The medium-sized tumor study was the most important. We looked at 1,300 patients and it said half of them radiation in the form of brachytherapy, and the other form 
eye removal, and they showed there was no difference in survival. Another study, which was a bit less important, was on the very large tumors, where we kind of used radiation prior to eye removal. We found that radiation did not help reduce the risk of metastasis in the future. So what do we do? Um, I mentioned that nevi are very common, but very few of them grow. What do we do to address that? Well, the Shields and Shields Group from Philadelphia published an amazing study uh, in 2018, looking at 3,800 small chlorodomyositis lesions, less than 3 millimeters in thickness, and about 18% of them grew. Did over four years uh, mean follow-up, mean follow-up, and what they found is that these are the risk factors that we use now to assess for uh, what is the risk of this small lesion demonstrating growth in the future. We look at thickness, the presence of fluid, whether we've lost a significant division from the lesion, whether there's orange pigment, whether there's hollowness on ultrasound, and whether the diameter is greater than five millimeters. And there's many other formulas that other people use in other centers, which is the one we use here in Alberta. And this one shows that if you have zero risk factors and only a 1% chance of five years of lesion will grow, and if we approach three risk factors or more, or we're getting to 50% or higher, that there will be growth of the lesion and it will be labeled a melanoma. This provides guidance on how to um, conduct follow-up and treatment. So what do we do? If there's zero risk factors, we observe infrequently. If there's one to two risk factors, we observe quite frequently. And if there's greater than three risk factors, we'll often, often discuss treatment and or biopsy versus observation. Discussing treatment in lesions that are small but have lots of risk factors are, is a difficult, long discussion. We talk about the risk of vision loss, which can be mild or severe depending on the location of lesions. We can talk about the risk of metastasis if you watch a lesion, which is actually quite a controversial area in ocular oncology. And then we focus on the priority, the first priority being uh, preserving life, the second priority being preserving the eye, and the third being preserving as much vision as possible. There are many treatments for melanoma, including radiotherapy, which can come in many forms. Brachytherapy is the most common in the world. Uh, but proton and serum tactic therapy are other excellent forms of therapy used in some centers in certain size or locations of tumor. You can perform resection or excising the tumors. And you can form a nucleation where you remove the eye. Nucleation is used in our center most commonly either when the tumor is too large for radiation or for patients who are unable to attend the frequent follow-up uh, visits that are required after um, radiation. There's adjuvant treatments are used in some centers to reduce the risk of uh, tumor recurrence, including transcutary thermal therapy, which many of you have heard uh, is um, labeled as TTP. And we circled here brachytherapy, which is worldwide and is the most common treatment, but it is not the only treatment uh, used. Here's a quick discussion of a surgical photo of brachytherapy from an atlas, surgical atlas. Uh, so if anybody doesn't want to see any surgical pictures, this is the time to close your eyes. So here we go. Um, and this is a, a kind of an older uh, photograph, but it still shows the basic premise of what we do. Um, and here we cast a light into the eye, photograph A, and that shows us kind of the outline of the tumor. We then mark the outline of the tumor there, and then we suture the radioactive plaque with the suture here to the wall of the eye to ensure that it's sitting in perfect position. That stays in anywhere from three to seven to eight days, depending on the size of the tumor and the location you have in treatment and other factors such as um, type of radioisotope. Many of you have either experienced or heard about transcutaneous thermotherapy it's used in some centers as an adjuvant treatment for melanomas. And basically, when you have the patients lining up in the slip lamp machine, we use a diode laser as you've seen in that photograph, and we use these spots to highlight uh, the areas of treatment 
before we kind of represent the three millimeter spot size. Then we walk around uh, the tumor treating it, and this is what it looks like uh, a few months later uh, after successful treatment. Now we'll talk about treatments of radiation uh, complications or radiation retinopathy. And as you guys have probably uh, heard, that you can get bleeding inside the eye as these red spots, red spots uh, inside show, or these white spots are called cotton wool spots, and abnormal blood vessels everywhere, secondary treatment of the melanoma sitting right underneath the picture. Um, these are some findings that we see when we look inside the eye. In addition, you can see these cysts of fluid inside the retina uh, in the fovea region which causes the vision to go down. So what do we do in these situations? Most commonly we inject medications into the eye, anti vegf medications which can be uh, labeled um, either Evastin, Ilea or Lucentis with different companies and different medications. Sometimes we'll perform laser on the retina around the tumor to reduce the oxygen demand. And sometimes we'll inject, inject steroids either inside the eye or what's in this, what's called the subtenon space. And the photograph of the OCT on this side shows that you can see this is before treatment and this is after treatment. All the fluid has gone away and the person's vision has improved. These are some examples of the different kinds of needles. So this is the most common needle. It's called intravitreal. And we actually inject into the vitreous cavity in the eye so the needle passes through the eye wall. Whereas a subtenon injection, we inject underneath the white part of the eye, but the needle goes through the thick, hard white part of the eye, the sclera, and it sits around the eye. And those are ways to get medications into the eye. This is an example of using laser coagulation. Each one of these white spots is a laser burn, and it basically um, reduces oxygen demand in the area of treatment. Now let's talk a bit about more some advances in brachy therapy. Um, in the traditional plaque design, we assumed that all eyes were exactly the same size. We measured the tumor and we said we'll treat the tumor plus two millimeters in a perfectly round circular uh, radiation field. And we'll treat it with 85 gray, which is the way of measuring the tumor to the apex of the tumor. And that was how things were when I trained in graphic therapy. We would shine light as you saw, and then we draw the tumor on the outside, and then we place it. And that would be kind of our only way of localizing the location of the plaque uh, to the tumor. But things have come a long way, um, and nowadays we use more advanced techniques. Um, um, to treat melanoma. One of the ways of achieving that is using CT scan and fundus photos and linking them together so we can create a three-dimensional image of the tumor and the optic nerve and the fovea and measure the true size and shape of the eye. This allows us to uh, you know, pinpoint the exact location of the tumor in relation to the entire extent of the person's eye and then predict where we should put the stitches to uh, put the um, plaque or bracket therapy suture, um, suture plaque in a perfect location that um, it maintains the greatest amount of safety and reduces the great amount of vision loss. And here is a photograph, you don't, don't worry about the words on the left, of a standard um, radiation plaque Design with a round field. And here is a more advanced one. What you can see is instead of this blue area being round and continuing along like this, look almost looks like the mouth is chewed away at this. And this is a area of the radiation delivery. And what we've achieved in this situation is we've reduced the radiation dose of the optic nerve and the fovea in the hopes of reducing the amount of vision loss. And that's by using these more advanced design and advanced. Um, uh, plates that hold this need. Here's a 3D model that we can rotate and surgically plan before we actually go in the operating room, which allows us to understand where the tumor is relating to all the critical structures, including the muscles on the outside of the eye. Here's an example, a, a kind of a simple example of some of the things we do 
uh, and the medical physicist, the radiation oncologist that work with us help us a lot in this regard. If we take a standard, what we call the fully loaded plaque, which means we put the seeds in every location, it creates this wonderful round radiation field. In this situation, when we put it in the eye, unfortunately we destroy the fovea, the central vision, because the dose of radiation to that area is higher than it can tolerate and the person loses their uh, vision. But can we do better? What if we were to remove one seed, we were to remove this seed, and then that changed the radiation a bit. So instead of having a high dose for the rest of fovea, now the fovea gets a very low dose, and we can preserve vision. And that's what one of the methods that we use to reduce radiation delivery to the um, critical structures without reducing the safety and treatment of the tumors themselves. We have now many shapes and sizes for plaques that we can use, which help us in this regard. And here's an example of a original comp design, which we still use in many situations, where every this is a, every seed of radiation sits next to the other one. And here we have metal around every seed, which collimates. If you can see, this is kind of a green line demonstrating how much radiation is delivered and how wide of an area is to achieve the tumor. And if we move that green line over, we can achieve exactly the same dose to the tumor using this modern design, but we save a lot of healthy eye from receiving the radiation by not requiring as much. Dr. Mel Astrahan from the University of Southern California has been a pioneer in this area. We do use his software and his uh, principles in helping us uh, achieve these goals. We're getting near the end of the presentation. I was asked to go over some specific questions. One of them is one of the biggest challenges facing patients. I found this um, a very difficult question to answer. I find and feel that almost everything the patient is going through when they get diagnosed and then undergo treatment for melanoma uh, can be challenging. They've been diagnosed with a cancer, they hear the word cancer. The tumor and the treatment can cause vision loss. The treatment often occurs in cities outside of where they live and where the support structures are. It's associated with increased travel, the cost, and isolation. The treatments have some risks and they take some, they cause downtime and recovery. And they're facing the risk of spread of the tumor, you know, it's facing the risk of metastasis and death. The schedules for the rest of the line will be impacted with all these procedures and doctor appointments and interventions. So if you think what is the most difficult is almost impossible for me to answer. Um, and I think it changes over which stage of diagnosis and treatment and outcome they have is quite varied. What we have developed and are just in the process of publishing right now is a patient report outcome measure that's directly uh, focused on uh, melanoma patients in the eye. And the idea is that patients, uh, we develop a questionnaire focused on what patients have told them is worrisome and concerning and challenging. And what we want to do is have the patients fill out these questionnaires in the waiting room. And as a result, um, that will um, provide us some input when they come to see us, ask them what questions that don't always pop up during the interview. We're so focused on vision and tumor control, but sometimes many other things that are worrisome or bothersome to patients that don't get brought up. And this is a way of standardizing that and hopefully improving our ability to address all the patients' concerns. And hopefully within the next six months to a year, uh, everybody or some centers will be using this uh, new tool to help and provide patients care for this, you know, very challenging question and situation. I was also asked to talk about some new and exciting treatments. I'm sure some of you guys have heard about AU011, uh, which is a very uh, interesting medication where a nanoparticle is injected into the eye. And then a laser light, very similar to the TTT light, is used to activate uh, these nanoparticles which attach to melanocytes and therefore damage the melanoma. We're hoping in the next few months in um, Calgary to become one of the uh, treatment centers for this experimental uh, treatment to see if uh, certain situations it can be helpful in treating small tumors and reducing vision loss, but it's way too early to know um, the effect we're going to have. 
Another question was asked, is, are there going to be adjuvant and neoadjuvant treatment coming? And uh, my, my opinion is the answer is absolutely, and hopefully um, Dr. Butler is speaking on this conference, uh, and this is one of his areas of expertise in terms of the systemic treatment he used to treat melanoma, and some of these will be used in the adjuvant setting. Uh, I believe Pabentifus, and I think those are, I think it's called Kimtrac, is what the uh, word used for patients, or some PRAIM inhibitors that are out there might be the most logical next or first step in these adjuvant trials. There already are some uh, ongoing now in several centers in the United States and Europe, uh, but these are kind of um, more uh, kind of on the um, periphery of experimentation. Where expenditures or cream inhibitors might be um, more mainstream in terms of the, uh, the use of an adjuvant uh, treatment. Um, another question I was asked was, how do we achieve earlier detection? And I think that's a question that's very near and dear to my heart. I want to take a step back, and I think we also need to think about not only earlier detection but prevention, and that's why. I spent so many years studying the association of ultraviolet light. If, if you do find out that ultraviolet light in childhood is associated with melanoma, then maybe if you, uh, wearing sunglasses in children will dramatically improve overall outcomes, which will see less disease. But when it comes to earlier detection, I think one of the obstacles is, uh, is delays in referral from optometry to ophthalmology. Or the lack of recognition during optometric exam that there's actually something in the eye that just wasn't noticed. Uh, hopefully, with the new wide angle wide field cameras, optometrists will see these lesions earlier than they did before, and hopefully they'll be um, willing to send the patients early on for evaluation of the risk factors to understand uh, if any of these lesions. Um, need to be treated early or fall closely. And I think that will be a huge uh, benefit if we can achieve that. Our team, we partnered with uh, some um, computer engineers and experts in artificial intelligence. And we've already built our first and second generation um, uh, tool to try to find melanomas and nevi inside eyes uh, from just a simple honest photograph. And the idea is um, if we can get a photograph done at the time of the doctor's office or the optometrist's office, um, and then that is evaluated by the um, artificial intelligence software and says, yes, there is a reason here, this needs to be referred to your local specialist, here is the name of that specialist, that maybe we can uh, prevent some of the delays that we're seeing regularly in referral uh, for uh, treatment. We're already getting to the point that approximately 90% of lesions can be detected by our algorithms, and I'm hoping uh, by the end of 2023 we'll be closer to 98%, and then looking to uh, partner and utilize this um, technology. Another question I asked, I was asked about is radiation retinopathy inevitable? And unfortunately, the answer is both yes and no. It depends on the size and location of the tumor. Um, the, here's an example of a small melanoma right next to the fovea. And so uh, there's an exit the fovea here and an exit the optic nerve. These are very critical structures for vision. So you can see there are two Three rings of treatment. One, the blue one is the edge, the actual edge of the tumor. The second ring is the area that when we treat with radiation will be completely ablated and destroyed. And therefore there will be no functioning retina or eye in that area. So in this case, the fovea is within that area. So we do not expect good central vision in that area. The next area between the first and the second green line is an area that I would call it a stunned or injured retina that may recover with treatments for radiation retinopathy and therefore uh, has a chance of preserving vision from that part of the eye. So in this example, if we do a good job and we're able to preserve the optic nerve because it's the secondary low dose the optic nerve association, the what we call the nasal retina, which is involved in the temporal visual field, should be preserved. 
And uh, as a result, the patient, as long as the other eye stays uh, free of disease and has good vision, will function almost completely normally. In contrast, here is a tumor, where here is the fovea, here is the optic nerve. And when we treat this, we will have to treat both the fovea and optic nerve uh, to doses beyond it, what they can tolerate. And since the optic nerve is the table that takes the vision from the eye to the brain, we will expect to lose the majority of the vision from this eye. And eye preservation as opposed to vision preservation, so we have a cosmetically good-looking eye, is a more reasonable goal uh, in this setting. Here's a third case where we have kind of a medium-sized melanoma, and it's far away from the fovea and the optic nerve. So in this case, we expect excellent preservation of visual function with only a uh, small reduction in the visual field down low in our vision. Um, so in this situation, we uh, can uh, preserve excellent vision. So based on the location and size of the tumor, we do expect different levels of vision loss or radiation impactful radiation retinopathy. Now here's a tumor that I picked as an example. Uh, it's a small melanoma, but it's relatively close to fovea. And if we use standard radiation techniques, the fovea will get a dose that's too high and a patient is expected to lose almost all of their central vision. But what if Dr. Kremler or myself decide to use some of those more advanced techniques in this case and maybe we can design a radiation field that's a bit more favorable? And now you can see that the, the distance of the above threshold radiation dose is far away from the fovea. And so we do expect in this case to hopefully preserve vision. What if in addition to the modern radiation techniques that we use, uh, we want to also uh, provide this patient with anti-digest medications or steroid treatments, and maybe we can even shrink the area so the area can last a bit further um, to that blue area, and then we the chance of excellent preservation of vision goes even higher. So can we do things? Yes. Are we doing things? Yes. But there always is some damage with radiation and basically the location and size will uh, if that may determine the extent of vision loss. This is an area that's rapidly evolving and I do expect in the next five to ten years to have some drastic improvement in overall visual function after treatment. Because we have a couple minutes, I'll quickly talk about some of the clinical factors related to prognostication because I believe Dr. Kremo was tasked with talking about molecular tests. The location of the tumor um, is important where iris lesions uh, do a bit better than all of them and the ones that involve the ciliary body do a little bit worse. With modern uh, testing, I believe in the next year or two we might uh, move location off our radar and find uh, the molecular test of genetics of the tumor can uh, provide prediction uh, without location. Size is definitely a uh, current factor, uh, even with um, genetic testing. The older you are when you're diagnosed with melanoma, the more likely you are that the tumor will spread. And there's some other more minor ones, like with the level of pigmentation, subretinal fluid, bleeding in the eye, and, and, and slight extension outside the eye all increase the risk. Tumor size, and a more specific way of looking at it, is looking at millimeter per millimeter, and you can see the dramatic increase uh, as the tumors get bigger. And then if we have biopsies of a tumor, and non-molecular testing does provide us some further information. Here are my references, and that is the end of the uh, recording. Thank you again for being, inviting me and taking the time to listen to this talk, and hopefully uh, everybody has learned a little bit more about uh, melanoma of the eye. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Weiss, for such an informative presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to give us such a detailed and comprehensive overview of primary ocular melanoma. We now have a 10-minute break, and we'll resume with Mark Jennings. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. We are now at our third session for today, and I have another patient story for you. 
and happy to introduce Mark Jennings. Mark lives in Calgary with his wife for 44 years. He is 67 years old and retired. He has several business interests, most notably to me, an interest in a pub. He belongs to the Kinsman Club of Calgary, a service organization that supports his community. Mark enjoys walking, getting together with friends, and traveling when he is permitted to miss one or two treatments. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Kathy. Um, hopefully everybody can see and hear me. Uh, welcome back. Um, what a great afternoon this is turning out to be. Um, we'll now continue with the rest of the presentations, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself. In 2014, I started to experience flashes of light over my <coughs> left eye, uh, known as floaters. I went to my optometrist who immediately sent me to the Rocky View Eye Clinic in Calgary. Um, where I was diagnosed um, with ocular melanoma, uh, which I'd never heard of. And uh, of course, I don't think any of us had unless you actually come down with it. Um, at that time, I was fortunate enough to be treated with plaque brachytherapy by the wonderful Dr. Weiss, whose presentation, or presentation we just heard. And I continue to see Dr. Weiss on a regular ba basis. Um, a full six years after my original diagnosis, um, I developed my first metastases in my liver in 2020 and had a liver resection surgery to remove two tumors. I was clear up until April of last year. Uh, metastases returned to my liver. Surgery was no longer an option. And I qualified to start on Tebentifus last June under the watchful eyes of Drs. Smiley and now Dr. Monzon in Calgary. I've had 39 treatments to date and things are going well. My most recent MRI two weeks ago shows uh, that I have no new tumors and no tumor growth um, since starting the treatments last June. I'm very blessed to have been cared for by such wonderful uh, medical practitioners. And the last thing I'll leave you with is I, I went eight years uh, from my first diagnosis, um, hoping to... Um, meet another OM patient um, to compare stories. And of course, we're such a rare breed that that's sometimes difficult to do. Uh, however, I was fortunate enough to uh, discover Occumel Canada and the Save Your Skin Foundation, um, the most marvelous organizations that I know of. And uh, of course, now able to share stories with uh, other patients who have this uh, rare and uh, deadly disease. Um, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Crema as our next speaker. Uh, he's the director of uh, ocular oncology at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. Uh, he will be presenting on the value uh, for testing, uh, testing for patients uh, and physicians and making treatment decisions, followed by some questions. Uh, immediately after Dr. Crema, we will have two quick presentations. The first one will be by Dr. Alcina from Castle Biosciences, and the second by Jamie Jessen from Impact Genetics, who will do a presentation on the value and availability of testing and discussion around testing tools. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our symposium today. My talk is about the estimation of metastatic risk in uveal melanoma and the significance of genetic testing in predicting the potential of metastasis in uveal melanoma. As you know, um, uveal melanoma is the most common cancer to develop in adult eyes. Just like any cancer, it has the potential to spread outside the eye to involve other organs. If spreads happen, the liver is the most common site to be involved first in over 90 cases, in over 90% of the cases of spread. Uh, other organs also might be involved eventually, such as um, lungs or um, the subcutaneous tissue uh, or any other organ. 
there's been um, excellent advances in the diagnosis and management of uveal melanoma in the past years. Uh, however, there is still a uh, high, high incidence of mortality from uh, melanoma. The overall mortality rate still ranges between 40 to 50 percent after 15 years uh, from the diagnosis. Obviously, there are uh, several factors uh, that uh, influence uh, the potential for spread. So not all melanomas are created equal. Um, when we look clinically at uh, more or less similar melanomas, it's hard to predict which one will metastasize over time. So here you have uh, four patients with four uh, more or less similar melanomas in size and location within the eye. Uh, however, um, they behaved differently over time. So it's hard basically just on clinical grounds to tell which melanoma will uh, spread or not at an individual level. So the question of which melanoma would spread has been uh, always uh, linked to the diagnosis of melanoma. In the 1970s of the past century, uh, it was thought that um, metastasis can occur secondary to uh, inoculation as a treatment for melanoma. Um, Zimmerman and his colleagues noticed that there is an increase within the two years following inoculation, increase in the incidence of uh, metastasis. And they attributed that to the inoculation procedure itself as the manipulations during the procedure allow for squeezing of tumor cells outside the globe into the bloodstream and cause metastasis. Um, the recommendations at that time to the surgeons is to do minimal manipulation uh, inoculation so they do not um, spread tumor cells outside of the eye. Um, a few years later, uh, another group noticed that there are circulating melanoma cells uh, in the blood of patients after uh, radiation. Uh, so it was doubted then if radiation give enough control of melanoma uh, and prevents metastasis. So the debate here was which is safer for the patient to do inoculation or to do uh, radiotherapy. That led to the initiation of the collaborative ocular melanoma study. That was a large uh, clinical trial uh, that involved 43 clinical centers in North America, including two in Canada. And uh, it enrolled uh, more than 2,500 patients uh, into this study, which is a large number for a rare disease. The study was designed to divide um, the melanoma uh, into three groups according to their sizes, small, medium, and large. Small was defined at the thickness of uh, 2.5 millimeter or less, um, or, or sorry, less than 2.5 millimeters. The medium was 2.5 to 10 millimeters, and the large was a thickness of more than 10 millimeter or have a base of more than 16. Uh, mind you that the diameter of the eye is about 22 millimeters, so 16 millimeter is a large base. The small group uh, was um, um, observed for uh, without treatment on the assumption that they are too small uh, to cause uh, damage to the eye or uh, spread outside the eye. The medium group from 2.5 to 10 millimeter, as you can see, that's a big range. The patient were randomized between uh, going to radiotherapy uh, versus inoculation to define which is uh, safer to the patient long term. And the large group were randomized between uh, 
going to uh, inoculation upfront or to have a course of radiotherapy to the eye before inoculation to sterilize the tumor, um, damage the tumor cells. So in case if they are squeezed outside the eye during uh, the inoculation procedure, uh, it wouldn't cause metastasis. So the results showed that uh, this group of small patients that had no treatment, only 30% grew to medium medium size at five years. And if you flip the coin, it means 70% uh, did not grow at five years. So maybe they were not melanoma, because melanoma by definition is a cancer and it should grow. So maybe they were suspicious nevi or what we call indeterminate melanocytic lesions, that these lesions that have one or two uh, clinical risk criteria that they will grow, but they never grow. Uh, so they were on the benign side. And that's why the tumor mortality in this group was as low as 1% at five years. And the recommendations at that time is tumors less than 2.5 millimeter it's kind of safe to observe without treatment. The medium sized group were the 2.5 to 10 millimeter. Um, there was no statistically significant difference in survival, whether you remove the eye or do radiation with brachytherapy. Uh, and that changed uh, the trend towards more conservative treatment using brachytherapy instead of removing the eye because the patients can keep their eye and maybe with some vision instead of losing the eye, since the life prognosis is more or less similar. The tumor mortality at five years in, in this group was 11%. The large group, which is a tumor more than 10 millimeters, there was, again, no uh, statistically significant difference in survival, whether they had radiation before inoculation or had uh, inoculation upfront. Uh, and that disproved Zimmerman's hypothesis that inoculation uh, causes tumor dissemination and increase metastasis and mortality. So that saved the patient from having a course of radiation before inoculation. And inoculation is done in large tumors uh, nowadays without the need for having a course of radiation uh, beforehand. Uh, the tumor mortality rate in this group was about 27% at five years. As you see, the larger the tumor, there is more likelihood of mortality, despite whatever treatment we give. So the COMS was uh, an excellent start in categorizing and looking at the prospects of fluvial melanoma. However, it was uh, not complete. Um, because it did not answer all the question about different kinds of melanoma. Melanoma involving uh, people at younger age or involving uh, large part of the ciliary body or have an unusual uh, growth pattern within the eye, um, tumors near to the optic disc, uh, to the optic nerve, uh, Patients who had history of cancer or new suppressive therapy were not included in the study. It was a large list of exclusions. And also the criteria of small melanoma, as I explained, was not clear what is a suspicious nevus versus what is a melanoma. And that's still uh, a common debate until now. Um, the medium size category, as I said, was a wide range from 2.5 millimeter thickness up to 10 millimeter thickness. You cannot really uh, lump these uh, extremes into one category and talk about one survival prediction in such a wide range of tumor sizes. And it did not consider mortality uh, in recurrent cases after reducer. But again, was a good start for a management and decision making and counseling patients of uveal melanoma. More studies came and started to show the relative risk uh, of metastasis uh, in uveal melanoma. So patients who are of older age, uh, more than 60, 
are at relatively higher risk than patients who are less than 60. Similarly, patients with larger base tumor or thickness or have a diffuse a flat profile, meaning that the base is uh, significantly larger than the thickness of the tumor, are at higher risk than those with uh, maybe a dome-shaped tumor. Um, patients who have involvement of the ciliary body. Ciliary body is the area of the uveal tissue just behind the iris. So tumors growing at the front of the eye just behind the iris involve the ciliary body. And that involvement was found to be statistically associated with high risk of metastasis. Or the patients who have uh, spread outside the eye uh, at the, the um, time of uh, the diagnosis, um, extension of the tumor outside the eyeball. So all of these present clinical factors associated with relatively high risk of metastasis. The TNM staging uh, developed later to look at all these clinical findings together. TNM staging stands for tumor nodes, which are the local lymph nodes, and metastasis uh, at the time of the diagnosis um, to give a prediction for survival uh, in different tumors according to uh, clinical risk factors without the need to look at the histology of the tumor or the cells of the tumor. And um, in melanoma, that evolved into um, a big um, uh, study retrospective data that, uh, obtained from several centers um, that looked at uh, tumors, tumor base, tumor thickness, ciliary body involvement, presence of extraocular extension, presence of lymph nodes at the time of the diagnosis, which is um, doesn't happen with uveal melanoma until unless it um, uh, penetrates uh, the eye wall uh, and start to involve structures outside the eye, like the conjunctiva or the orbit, then it can metastatize to the local lymph nodes or presence of distant metastasis at the time of the diagnosis. And the way it works is that we put the tumor dimensions, the base versus the apex or the thickness of the tumor. Uh, and that gives us a T size. So for example, if you have a tumor that's 10 millimeter and a height of uh, seven millimeter, it will fall as, it will be categorized as T2. And then we add a letter, uh, whether it involves the ciliary body or not. Um, the ciliary body involvement has an extraocular extension or not, or presence of any extraocular extension that's larger than five millimeters. So we add that letter to the T category. And with the presence of node or metastasis, uh, that creates a stage. So according to the TNM classification, there are seven distinct stages uh, of melanoma. And these translate into seven uh, 10 year survival possibilities. So that gives more or less uh, a rough, but a more, uh, but a better estimation of the risk of metastasis that we can counsel the patients uh, based on it without the need for obtaining tissue from the tube. Um, and that has been validated uh, several times. The histological risk factors is um, a reliable um, uh, way of predicting metastasis in case if we obtain uh, tumor tissue. So tumors that are treated with inoculation of the eye or resection of the tumor from the eye uh, have uh, may have some histological features or tissue uh, features that are predictive of higher risk for metastasis. So for example, if the cells look uh, round and plumb with large nucleus, like what we call it epithelioid cells, have higher risk than uh, melanoma with cells that are bundly and arranged like 
uh, spindles, what we call spindle melanoma. Uh, uh, in, in this case, the epithelioid have higher risk than spindle. And some cases have mix of this and that. And uh, again, uh, it would be hard to say on individual basis which one has higher risk. Uh, the presence of uh, pseudo blood vessels within the tumor, what we call vasculogenic mimicry, where you can see tracks that allows for the um, blood cells uh, to penetrate through the tumor cells, presumably to provide nourishment for the tumor. Presence of that is associated with high risk. Presence of lymphocytic infiltration, these are the cells of immune system, uh, which when invade the tumor are usually associated with higher risk. And um, if the matrix of the tumor, the background of the tumor has this kind of back-to-back -back loops, has been also found to be associated with higher risk for metastasis. So all these risk criteria depends on obtaining a piece of tissue from the tumor. And that can only happen if the eye is removed or if the eye wall is opened and the tumor was resected uh, off of it. And that's not the trend in treating melanoma since it, we rely more uh, on radiotherapy. So a breakthrough happened in the 1990s when uh, this paper was published by um, a group in Germany. Here they found that there are changes happening at the chromosomal level within the cells of uh, the tumor that can have uh, implications uh, in predicting uh, spread of the tumor. Uh, they found that if you lose one of the pair of chromosome 3 uh, in the tumor cells, uh, the there is a likelihood of 50 percent of developing metastasis five years late within the within the following five years in comparison to the patients who have the normal number of chromosomes so let's go back and um, remember um, what are we talking about here the, the human body and uh, including the tumor cells, the, tu the tumors are made of cells. The cell would have an organelle inside called the nucleus that have uh, the chromosomes which, which carries the information uh, uh, that uh, influence the cell function. Uh, the chromosomes are in humans are uh, arranged in 23 pairs. Um, there are 46 chromosomes, 23 are coming from the father and 23 from the mother. Um, these chromosomes are made of large and long coils of uh, DNA, and each segment of that DNA is called a gene. Uh, the gene influences the function or uh, several functions uh, of the cell. Uh, the DNA uh, produces RNA, which is a messenger that carries the information outside the nucleus to an or another organelle called the ribosome, which translates the uh, information or the uh, on the RNA into uh, proteins. It, it starts to build amino acids into a polypeptide chain and polypeptide chains form a protein. The protein is the biological uh, molecule that performs the function, whether it's something like producing a pigment to influence the cell membrane, uh, uh, penetrability or permeability of a cell, uh, etc. So in patients with uh, melanoma, they found that loss of one of the two chromosome three might be associated is associated with higher risk of metastasis and that opened the door is that all we need is just to have few cells instead of having a full tissue full piece of tissue 
to look at and decide who, which patient is at risk. That opened the era of individualized um, uh, management of melanoma based on what's happening to this particular chromosome, uh, this particular tumor in this particular patient. So we started to learn to take a uh, few cells by needle biopsy from uh, melanoma, depends on their, si their location inside the eye and their size, several techniques, and we just use a needle to withdraw some cells and send it for analysis to look at the chromosomes and their status so we can have individualized information to each patient. As the studies um, uh, continued, we started to identify more chromosomal changes uh, associated with uh, metastasis. So we found that there is a poor prognosis if you lose chromosome 3, whether totally or partially. Uh, if you gain part of the chromosome 8, Q here stands for the uh, longer part of the chromosome. Uh, the chromosome is made of two parts, each chromosome, short part and a long part. The long part is the Q and the short part is P. So 8Q gain is associated with higher risk, 6Q six, six loss and 1P loss. Uh, good prognosis was associated with 6P gain. And the methods for checking um, were karyotyping or the FISH technique, which is still used in some centers. Here we uh, fluoresce the chromosome to look at their numbers within the cell. So as you can see here, if you have uh, two chromosomes, three, uh, you see that two pairs of chromosomes, three, are uh, fluorescent in red color, eight in, in green color. In case if you lose uh, one of chromosome threes, like those cases with high risk of metastasis, see only one dot, and if you gain more of chromosome 8, you see uh, three green dots. So by that way, we can tell about the number of chromosome. Uh, having said that, still it cannot uh, identify if part of the chromosome is missing um, because um, that can functionally uh, increases the risk of metastasis uh, when you can see uh, actually two dots representing the chromosome. So it's not a very reliable um, uh, testing method. Uh, MLPA is what we commonly use uh, in our center. And that requires comparison between the normal um, chromosomes, the normal number of chromosomes taken from the buccal mucosa of the patient versus those obtained from the eye. So we take a sample from the tumor inside the eye using a fine needle. That's a very small uh, needle that um, we use for injection of insulin uh, children. It's not uh, very aggressive to the eye. And we enter through the tumor uh, base and suck up uh, some cells, we draw some cells and send it for analysis, and that hole created is uh, covered by the radioactive plug. So uh, any tumor cells within the tract created or may escape through the hole outside the eye is burnt instantly by the radiation. So it's quite safe uh, procedure. And then we sub submit it for uh, the lab for centrifugation, uh, DNA amplification and sequencing, and we get the results graphically represented. Uh, with more research, we started to identify individual genes on the chromosomes that have link with tumor behavior in uvian melanoma. Um, Genes like GNAQ and GNA11 are associated with the early switch uh, of an EVAS into a melanoma or early growth of melanoma. And we use these uh, genes, the presence of these mutated genes, 
to tell that the sample is taken from a tumor actually and not from a nearby uh, normal uvea tissue. Uh, BAP1 is a single gene that's most associated with uh, metastasis. Um, it's a gene uh, carried on chromosome 3, as was expected, because this is the, cr the chromosome that, if it's damaged or lost, uh, the uh, metastasis risk increases. And it's a tumor suppressor gene, like it suppresses tumor growth, it suppresses tumor metastasis, that if it mutates or is damaged, uh, early metastasis occur. Other genes we know that our, their mutation is associated with good prognosis or some are associated with late metastasis. And uh, more genes are identified and being identified in uh, association with uh, behavior of melanoma. The DNA, as, as we mentioned, produces RNA, which is the messenger that takes the information from the DNA outside the nucleus to form the proteins. So the expression of the gene, the RNA produced by the gene has also been studied. And based on 15 uh, gene array, um, RNA can classify the melanoma into one of two categories, either class one, which are associated with lower metastatic risk, and class two, which is associated with higher metastatic risk. And uh, you can see the good results uh, of um, RNA or gene expression profiling is that it shows a significant difference between patients who carry class one uh, versus class two. Class one is further subdivided based on the RNA signature into class one A, which is very low risk of 2%, and class 1b, which is 21% uh, at five years, in comparison to class 2, which carries very high risk of 72% of developing metastasis. So that's another study uh, that's significant in looking at the uh, tumor uh, behavior in terms of metastasis. Looking at the proteins, this is the final or the end product of the uh, DNA forming RNA into protein. As we said, this is the uh, uh, end molecule, and that's uh, control lots of cell behavior like cell adhesion, cell division, the membrane receptor, uh, the, effect, the ability of the uh, cells to uh, attach themselves to other uh, organs. So this is the future research. Uh, there will be more future research in looking at the expressed proteins in melanoma um, to identify if the melanoma has the capacity to spread and cause metastatic disease. Um, in the last few years, we identified frame, which is a gene that's overexpressed uh, in uh, uvial and skin melanomas, uh, it forms a protein that can be identified by the immune system, the cytotoxic T cells, and that opened the door that um, we can use immunotherapy uh, in management of these melanomas that are um, expressing uh, these proteins in abundance. Uh, so. All of these are still in the horizon. So you might be confused at this point by all these tests and all these uh, possibilities of predicting metastasis at an individual level, uh, similar to the famous fable of the blind man and the elephant. The old Indian story where um, some blind people were asked to describe what is the elephant. The elephant in the room here is the, is, is the risk of metastasis. So each person is looking at it from one angle. So everybody is saying um, something partly right, but it's incomplete. Um, some people look at the risk according to the comms or the clinical factors or so forth. So that 
again doesn't give the full story. So that led to the uh, evolution of prognostication algorithm algorithms that combines several of these factors together to give higher accuracy in predicting uh, metastasis at an individual level. So, for example, the Cancer Genome Atlas classifies uh, the melanoma into four groups, depending on the more accumulation of risks obtained by the genetic testing. So, the more you have accumulation of chromosomal changes, uh, gene mutation, and RNA changes, uh, you have higher risk than uh, others. So it depends on obtaining uh, cytogenetics, which looks at chromosomes, uh, genomic mutation, BAP1, uh, positive or negative, or the other uh, genes uh, that control the behavior, the one that has good prognosis and one that has late metastasis. And uh, the RNA, are we uh, in class one or class two? and do the calculations that combine these to come with um, a potential for survival. The other uh, prognostic algorithm is uh, the Liverpool Uvan Melanoma Prognosticator, and that's the one we commonly use in uh, my center. Uh, that was uh, developed at the Ocular Oncology Service in Liverpool, and it has been validated as an individualized prognostication model. Um, it started with neural networks, artificial intelligence, and moved to non-Kaplan-Meier uh, analysis. Uh, basically, it combines the clinical and the cytogenetic data or the histopathology data in case of the eyes inoculated to build an individualized survival curve for each patient. So the inputs will include what we input in TNM, the clinical findings, the tumor base, thickness, and involvement of the ciliary body. Uh, it also takes into account the age of the patient. Um, if the eye was inoculated, we look at the features that we mentioned, the epithelioid versus spindle cells. Uh, and it looks also on the data obtained uh, through the needle biopsy, uh, cytogenetic data, chromosome 3 situation, and chromosome uh, 8 situation. So, again, these are all entered uh, as inputs into the algorithm, and it identifies an individualized curve for each patient. So, we are now in the era of individualized um, cancer medicine, where we uh, tell each patient based on this information obtained uh, his individual risk of metastasis. So here is an example that shows uh, what I just mentioned. Here we have two patients with two tumors, uh, more or less similar size, similar location. So uh, in the first patient, the tumor is uh, thickness is 6.3 millimeter, and the other patient, the tumor thickness is 6.2 millimeters. So according to the TNM staging, they, they clinically, they fall in the same group, and, and subsequently, they have the same survival. So they are in the same group or the same stage, which is 2B. So the 10-year survival here would be 68%. But after obtaining the needle biopsy, the one to the left is showing it has the normal number of chromosome disomy, like the two chromosomes are there, chromosome three. But this tumor lost uh, chromosome one of the two pair chromosome uh, three and uh, had eight, eight Q gain. And these combined increase the risk of metastasis. So that changes the survival uh, probability significantly. So for the first patient, according to the Liverpool, which combines the clinical and the cytogenetic data, the patient survival becomes 83%, but in the other patient, it drops down to 20%. So that shows you the significance of adding the genetic uh, testing information to the clinical data uh, to give uh, superior prediction for metastasis. 
So in on in my hospital a few years ago, there was a big banner hanging on the wall saying, "Why is in our DNA?" Uh, that's to withdraw the attention to the importance of genetic testing and looking at the N DNA of, in, of the tumors uh, in uh, deciding the management of the tumor. It's becoming an essential element in cancer management. Uh, for different types of cancers. There is an increasing awareness of genetic testing uh, and its links to uh, tumors, uh, the survival, the selection of some drugs in treatment uh, based on the genetic profile of, uh, of the patient. And the patients are aware of that from the social media and mainstream media. We have patients coming asking uh, about, are we going to do genetic testing for the melanoma? And we explain to them the value of uh, doing the test. So are we uh, applying genetic testing uh, to every patient? To every patient, uh, yes, but there are limitations. Is that sometimes we get sampling or processing error. A tumor is very small and the sample is not adequate. So uh, it might not yield results. However, this is a very small percentage of the cases that we do. Also, we are dealing with an invasive procedure. We insert a needle into the eye and to the tumor. However, we develop the skills uh, to make it as safe as possible. Uh, we prefer to enter the tumor at the base whenever possible to avoid entering through the retina and creating a retinal hole. <coughs> Excuse me. And that allows us to take maybe uh, more than one sample since it's safe to enter through the sclera. But generally speaking, we haven't had any uh, incidents of any um, damage to the tissues uh, of the eye uh, or the retina, even when we went through the retina. And as I've explained, when we enter through the wall of the eye into the tumor, that hole that we create in the eye, we cover uh, immediately with, uh, with the plaque radiotherapy. So there's no potential of tumor spread outside the eye. Another uh, fact is that melanomas have what we call cellular heterogeneity. Uh, not all the cells uh, carry the same uh, changes or the chromosomal changes within the tumor. You might have a clone of cells that's different from the tumor around. Hence the importance of taking biopsy uh, from several parts of the tumor uh, so as not to miss on a part that has a more of an aggressive clone than the rest. Um, and as I said, this would be easier if we enter through the sclera, we can direct our needle to take samples from different parts of the tumor. So we have uh, a good panoramic view of the um, genetic changes happening within uh, the tumor. And there is the psychological issue. Some patients are afraid to know, like um, I, I face that. Patients tell me, oh, I don't want to know that uh, this my tumor might be capable to spread. Uh, will be like a dark cloud on my life every day. Uh, but not knowing also doesn't change the fact that there might be something going on without uh, the patient's knowledge and it's better to know good bad news and be prepared for it uh, rather than be surprised by something happening and actually the patients who are in the medical field uh, are the ones who are usually show resistance to uh, know the outcome of their tumor some Doctors, some pa doctor patients um, tell me that just take the um, biopsy and don't tell me the results of it. Uh, so that shows you that there is a big psychological issue sometimes uh, with some patients not wanting to know the prognosis of their uh, cancer.
and also the coast. Um, the test is not yet covered in Ontario, so some patients have uh, to pay from their pocket if they don't have uh, insurance. So these are the things that might limit us from uh, doing uh, genetic testing for our melanoma patients. Once we get the results, the patients are divided into uh, a risk group. And we, uh, some years ago, we put uh, guidelines for metastatic surveillance. Uh, patients who are at high risk that have genetic high risk in any tumor size, or if they did not have the genetic testing and they have a large size melanoma, size 3 or 4, according to the TNM clinical criteria, or those who have um, inoculation and showed that the histology showing uh, epithelioid dominant uh, cells. Uh, they, we refer them to our medical oncology uh, team who usually order MRIs for them to screen for any metastasis every three to four months. In comparison to patients who are low risk that are uh, showed disomy 3 or showed uh, other class 1 or uh, no BAP1 mutation, genetic low risk or uh, in, in a patient with a small size melanoma, uh, one or two according to the TNM size categories, uh, or if they had inoculation and showed to be spindle melanoma with a small tumor, uh, then they can be followed by the ocular oncology group. Uh, and in that case, we order MRI once per year. Uh, this, this classification is by no means uh, final or it is uh, very accurate. It varies from one center to another. Uh, but that was, but this is based on the current information we have uh, regarding genetic testing and the data we have from publications and other parts uh, of the world of what is. Um, the frequency of uh, checking patients with uh, melanoma based on the uh, risk criteria that we find clinically or on genetic basis. Uh, and it's, we, every once in a while, we have a case that falls in between the groups and we discuss uh, uh, what we should do uh, with our medical oncology colleagues. So at this point, prognostic tumor biopsy of uvel melanoma is a common practice in most ophthalmic oncology centers. The stratification of the metastatic risk based on prognostic genetic information provides an individualized resource efficient metastatic surveillance scheme. So patients who have higher risk uh, are subjected to more MRIs, more maybe more physical exams, um, to trying to pick up uh, as uh, tumor spread to the organs, especially the liver, as early as possible. In comparison to the patients who are at low risk, there's no need to subject them to frequent uh, visits for uh, checking their system, uh, since the risk of metastasis is very low. Um, Another thing is that the earlier detection of metastasis uh, allows for earlier intervention uh, and uh, enrollment in one of the ongoing clinical trials for treatment of metastatic melanoma. Um, the earlier um, the detection um, gives a chance for the patient to have uh, one of the new immunotherapy drugs, if he's a candidate for, rather than patients will come with an advanced disease when uh, it's too late to do uh, anything. And also it provides useful information for the patient and his family. They know uh, what they are dealing with for better life planning. Is the treatment of the eye would end the risk, would end the problem, or there are still repercussions 
that this tumor could have possibly started to spread before we treated the eye. So that's the value of the information of getting um, genetic testing. We have more accurate prognostication of melanoma than what we used to have in the past just by um, calculating the risk based on tumor dimensions or location inside the eye. We add, by adding the genetic testing, we have more uh, accurate and more uh, individualized survival curve for each patient uh, that we could not have uh, in the past. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kremer, for a wonderful overview of prognostication from where we were to where we are. And we do have some questions in from patients. So if you're ready, uh, here's the first question. What is the role of prognostication in the treatment and follow-up? So as I just mentioned, the treatment is the same. It's not changed by the genetic testing, whether we're going to elect to do radiation or inoculation and which form of which form of radiation all of that related to the tumor dimensions and the location of the tumor inside the eye but the follow-up will definitely be modified according to the risk patients who are at higher risk of metastasis will be followed uh, more frequently and will be registered with the medical oncology team uh, trying to find the earliest uh, sign of metastasis as early as possible so the patients can start to get their medical care as early as possible in comparison to patients who are at very low risk because their tumor was so small and carry no uh, genetic changes for uh, that get, can uh, predispose to metastasis these cases we follow um, in, in the eye clinic and we uh, still do MRI, but not, but much less frequently. Thank you. And the next question: What's the typical plan for a high-risk patient? As I mentioned, we meant to refer to the medical oncology team, and uh, they have the expertise to uh, follow these patients, um, whether by themselves or they share the family physicians in um, ordering uh, the imaging of, for the patients and they follow the results of imaging and they are in continuous contact with the patient. Um, and once uh, something is discovered, uh, they take over care and they enroll the patient into uh, one of the clinical trials or they start them on one of the ongoing uh, immunotherapy or chemotherapy or maybe radiation therapy to deliver, like they, they have the expertise to choose what is the next step in treatment uh, once it's discovered outside the eye. Thank you. Here's another question. When did you first start using prognostic testing? So at Princess Margaret, I believe it's about more than 10 years. Uh, we've been offering the treatment, uh, the, the genetic testing uh, by uh, needle biopsy. Uh, to the patients, uh, to every patient. And as I mentioned, some patients um, have a psychological issue and I, I, try, I try also to tell them that uh, it's knowing and being um, uh, knowledgeable of the potentials is better than staying in the dark. Um, but generally speaking, we try to offer it to, to almost all of our patients. Thank you. Here's another question. How reliable have you found prognostic testing? That's a good question because actually we looked at all the patients that we have um, done the biopsy and got the genetic testing for and we, and we followed them uh, for the development of metastatic disease and survival. And we compared our rates with what is been predicted by the algorithms uh, that predict metastasis uh, that include the genetic testing with the clinical criteria such as the liverpool scheme that i just mentioned we found that they are significantly matching what happens in reality significantly matches with what's being predicted by the 
schemes that combine the clinical and um, the genetic testing. And when we compared our results, the real what happens it happened in reality to our cohort of patients, with what's being predicted by the TNF staging, which based only on clinical criteria doesn't include genetic testing, we find uh, some mismatch in, in some size uh, categories. So that tells you again that adding genetic information adds to the accuracy of prediction uh, of metastasis uh, in uvian melanoma. Thank you. We're almost there. When can you not do a biopsy? So basically we can do biopsy to any tumor because as I say, we have different techniques to approach tumors of different sizes in different locations in the eye. Uh, I wouldn't do it if the patient objects to it because the patient is uh, scared to do it. Uh, or uh, in case if the tumor is uh, very shallow, like less than one millimeter under the fovea, it's unlikely that this tumor would spread and the fovea is the most sensitive part of, of vision uh, inside the eye. So we might question the need of doing a biopsy in such a case because the risk here, as I say, very small and um, a, a needle inserted in that area might produce hemorrhage and can significantly affect vision. Also, patients uh, at the age of uh, 85 or more, especially if they have other uh, diseases uh, that can uh, affect their survival. We do not have the data for of survival, um, melanoma survival at this uh, age group. Um, and and um, in these cases, um, unless the family asks to know about it, we, we can do it. But uh, Again, we do not have um, survival data to compare um, between um, the potential of uh, mortality from melanoma versus uh, other diseases in, in such an advanced age group. Uh, perhaps these are the cases that we uh, do not offer genetic testing. And this is the final question. What do you do to advise a patient who is reluctant to have a biopsy? Uh, my advice is uh, to know and to be uh, on top of things is better than not knowing, even if it's bad news. Uh, because um, there are uh, drugs, uh, there are clinical trials, uh, there are measures that can be done when we discover uh, any spread uh, early, uh, rather than uh, wait until the disease uh, spread and becomes advanced and there is nothing that can be done. Uh, obviously, there is a psychological barrier and the fear of knowing that um, uh, my tumor is risky and uh, can start to show uh, its face at any time. Uh, but this is uh, better than uh, hiding from it and uh, uh, avoiding the knowledge that uh, something might happen. It's better to uh, be uh, on top of things uh, and discover the disease as early as, as possible so we can uh, try to help do something about it. Uh, so that's it, and thank you very much again. Uh, I wish that was clear. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. We really appreciate the time that you have given us. And now uh, back to Mark. Hi everyone, I am Kat Alcina with Castle Biosciences. This presentation will be an overview of Castle's uh, genomic testing services for patients with uveal melanoma. First, a little bit of background for those of you who are not familiar with Castle. We are a US-based diagnostics company focused on transforming disease management for, uh, for patients 
And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Decision DX UM, which is a prognostic test for uveal melanoma that is now used by around 90% of ocular oncologists in the U.S. Uh, and in parts of Canada to determine a patient's metastatic risk. We now also offer two additional tests for uveal melanoma that I'll provide some information about. This type of testing requires a tumor biopsy, and it allows us to analyze a number of different biomarkers in the tumor to determine its molecular signature, if you will. So all three of Castle's tests can be run from the single biopsy, um, and this can be either a fine needle aspirate biopsy, FNAB, or uh, FFPE, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue that's taken from an enucleation. But all three of the tests that we can run are shown here on the screen. Decision DXUM in the middle is our main test. It measures gene expression profiling levels. So we sometimes call it a gene expression profiling test. This test is really the only one of its kind that has been extensively studied, validated, and confirmed across multiple studies. The other two that are on either side of it um, are optional supplemental tests, which are still under investigation. Those are Decision DX Prime and Decision DX UM Seek. But excuse me, taken together, all of these tests offer a, a comprehensive molecular picture of the tumor. And again, all can be performed on tissue from a single biopsy sample. Now these, briefly, these are the results that each of the test gives. And I know it's a lot of information, but we're going to go through each of these one by one to kind of break it down. So we'll start with Decision DXUM. This, again, is a test that measures gene expression levels of we're looking at 15 genes in the primary tumor to determine whether the tumor is at low or high risk. So class 1A is the lowest risk, class 1B is intermediate risk, and class 2 is high risk. And this is a risk for the tumor spreading or metastasizing within five years. It's important to remember that the test has to be performed on primary eye tumor tissue, and it has to be performed before that tissue has been exposed to any type of treatment like plaque brachytherapy. So the timing is very important. Um, we, we need a, a sample of the tumor in its original state in order to get the most accurate prognostic information of how aggressive it may be. I'd also like to point out that the Decision DX UM test has been included in the NCCN guidelines for uveal melanoma since they were first uh, released in 2018. The guidelines that are shown here recommend different imaging intervals for patients based on their Decision DX UM class result, with the high risk class two patients recommended more frequent imaging than the medium and low risk patients. Decision DX UM has been supported by extensive published evidence. It's important to emphasize that the gold standard for validation of prognostic tests is in a prospective, so a forward-looking, multi-center study. And the Decision DX UM test is really the only test of its kind to have undergone that type of really rigorous validation. So the first validation of the test was described in a study by the Collaborative Ocular Oncology Group, the COOG. And that study included 459 patients from 12 ocular oncology centers who received testing with the test. And so what you can see from the pie chart is that about 60% of the tumors were low risk class one tumors and 40% were high risk class two tumors. And the graph on the right demonstrates that the test was really good at predicting outcomes between the high and the low risk tumors. So after five years of follow-up, 97% of the patients with class one tumors remained metastasis free compared to 20% of patients with class two tumors. And then I'd also like to point out that the Decision DXUM class two result was found to be the only independent predictor of metastasis when compared to other high-risk features like the tumor size um, or chromosome 3 status, monosomy 3. And a little more about that, the first validation study also looked at a subset of patients who had had both Decision DXUM testing, so gene expression profiling, and chromosome testing to compare the results from those two different prognostic methods. And so among patients who had both types of testing performed, about 20% of cases were considered to be discordant. 
So they were either low risk by Castle class, they were class one, but high risk by chromosome testing, um, or chromosome three status was monosomy three, or the opposite. They were high risk by Castle's testing and low risk by chromosome testing. And in those discordant cases, the gene expression profiling result, the class result, was found to be more accurate than chromosome three status in terms of predicting patient outcomes. So that's what you can see on the graph in panel B is um, the cases that were discordant are shown in blue and in red, and those more closely align with uh, the decision DX UM expected result. Now, since that initial Coog study, many independent studies have been published, those are shown here, that support use of this uh, gene expression profiling test. So to summarize this, the, this uh, slide, these studies have shown the test is accurate. Those are the, the studies listed in dark blue, that it has consistent performance across different patient populations. Those are the studies shown in teal and that it's clinically useful for guiding management decisions. So those studies are highlighted in gray. And then additionally, we have one recent study that was published uh, that evaluated the patient perspective towards prognostic testing, and that's shown in red. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you a little more about that study here soon. But altogether, published studies on decision DXUM have included more than 3,600 patients, which really represents the largest body of evidence for a molecular prognostic test in the field. Now, a little bit more about the patient experience study. As you all well know, patients play an extremely important role in the planning of their care. So this was a survey study that was published in collaboration with the Melanoma Research Foundation that explored patient attitudes towards prognostic testing. And of the 177 uveal melanoma patients who responded, who participated in the survey, 90% of them reported wanting prognostic information at the time of their diagnosis. Of those who had testing specifically with Decision DX UM, 99% reported gaining value from their test result. And that was regardless of their class. So in particular, the high risk patients, the class two patients reportedly benefited from a better understanding of their tumor biology and um, a, a, a sense that they were receiving more personalized care. And low risk patients reported a sense of relief from uncertainty about the future. Another important finding from this study was surrounding decision regret after testing. So on the left hand side of the screen, uh, patients experienced low decision regret after testing, uh, regardless of whether they received a high or low risk class result. Now you might be wondering how does prognostic testing change patient care? Well, thanks to the Decision DX UM test, doctors can really manage their patients according to their actual biological risk. So for example, class one patients, which make up more than two thirds of the patient population, can be placed on a low intensity surveillance regimen, while class two patients, which make up only one third of tested patients, can be managed with higher intensity surveillance, including more frequent uh, systemic imaging, and also may have the opportunity to receive novel treatments by entering into adjuvant clinical trials. Um, in other words, this test really identifies which patients can avoid unnecessary treatments and intensive surveillance, and uh, so that it can be focused on patients who really need this type of management the most to promote early detection and treatment of metastatic disease. Now, a little bit more about our Decision DX PRAME test. This test determines whether a tumor is positive or negative for expression of the PRAME gene. It gives a very simple positive, PRAME positive or PRAME negative result as shown here. Um, several years ago, there was some interesting work published by Dr. Bill Harbour reporting that increased expression of this gene, PRAME, is associated with a higher chance of metastasis in uveal melanoma. And so in a couple of 2016 studies, they looked at this and found that all of the class one low risk patients who were PRAME negative did very well. They remained metastasis free after five and 10 years of follow-up, whereas only about 60% of class one patients who were PRAME positive, who had increased expression of PRAME, were metastasis free at five years and all had experienced metastasis at 10 years of follow-up. So what about class two? Well, there is some uh, limited evidence 
that prime positivity may promote faster metastasis in class two patients. However, I should state that the exact clinical imp implications of PRAIM are still under investigation and are being prospectively validated in a multicenter study called the COOG-2 study. So, um, but because of the excitement around PRAIM and around these data, Castle started offering PRAIM testing in 2016 as an optional supplemental test. Um, a little bit of information about our UMSeq panel. This is the DNA mutation panel. This is our most recent addition to our suite of uveal melanoma tests. And um, it can detect, again, mutations, DNA mutations, in the three genes shown on the left that are thought to be associated with differential metastatic risk, um, but can also identify mutations in the four genes listed on the right-hand side, which are not prognostic, so they're not um, known to be associated with different risk, but may help to confirm that a melanocytic tumor was actually sampled. We started offering our DNA sequencing panel in 2018 due to a rising interest in mutational profiling of uveal melanoma tumors. So this diagram just lays out in uh, those genes that are profiled in our seven gene panel. Again, the genes that are shown in yellow um, are genes that are commonly mutated in uveal melanoma tumors. They're not associated with differential metastatic risk, but may be helpful for tumor sampling confirmation. And the three genes on the right, EIF1AX, SF3B1, and BAP1, have been shown to be associated with differential metastatic risk, with BAP1 mutations being most closely associated with high-risk class II tumors. But it is important to note that the Decision DX UM class result um, was found to be the strongest prognostic factor compared to those three prognostic mutations um, but we expect the utility of th these mutations to be helpful as a supplement to gene expression profiling. So this is just a summary uh, of those genes uh, that we are looking at, at our, with our seven gene panel. Um, and I won't belabor the point, but mutations in the four genes on the left frequently occur in, in UM tumors. Not prognostic may help to confirm that a lesion was in fact sampled. The mutations on the three genes on the right are associated with differential metastatic risk. And there's a lot of research underway to investigate the role of these gene mu mutations as therapeutic targets. Um, so, so they are beginning to be included as entry criteria in, in clinical trials. Finally, uh, it is important to remember that the prognostic significance of both the PRAIM uh, test and of the DNA mutations that we profile with our seven gene panel are still under investigation. So right now it's really unclear how best to integrate those results with the gene expression profiling result, the class result. But um, so, so those two biomarkers are currently being studied in the second multicenter prospective study by the COOG. It's called the COOG-2 study. And that study enrolled over 1,700 patients from 25 centers across the U.S. and Canada. And it will really, I believe it will be the largest prospective data set ever collected for uveal melanoma, which is really exciting. So we hope to have more insight soon from that study regarding the best combination of biomarkers for predicting metastatic risk in uveal melanoma. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope this provided a useful overview of CASEL's test offerings, but we're here to help answer and clarify any additional questions that you might have. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact us at any time with your questions. You can also go on our website, castletestinfo.com, that has uh, some helpful resources like our patient resource guide that's shown here that explains the testing process in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I hope you're having a wonderful meeting. My name is Jamie Jessen. I'm a genetic counselor and medical science liaison. I work with Impact Genetics. Uh, Impact Genetics is a small specialty division of Dynacare up here in Canada. So I wanted to start um, with a quick overview of some basic genetics, just to give you a feel for the science, because I think that can sometimes help us understand how the results and the prognostication works with the impact genetic test. Um, talk about the unique uh, tumor changes in, in uveal melanoma cells. 
and also to talk a little bit about personalized survivorship prediction and prognosis. So I just want to start with reminding everyone that, you know, while we think about cancer um, is quite common, all cancer is caused by genetic changes. It's things that happen by chance that accumulate in the cells. However, not all cancer is inherited. And uveal melanomas is, is probably a good example of that type of cancer. So when you think about, you know, a healthy cell might obtain a change or um, an alteration or a mutation sometimes called that begins the process of that cell becoming unhealthy. And if that cell then goes on to obtain more and more changes or mutations, the, the, the cell loses the ability to be healthy and can grow out of control and become what we call cancer or malignancy. And again, the majority of cancer of all types, these types of changes happen by chance, not because you've inherited uh, a predisposition from a parent. However, there are hereditary cancer syndromes that put people sort of at a higher risk to develop cancer. They're sort of born with that first mutation or first hit in every cell of their body and are at higher risk for cancers. We think that uveal melanoma tends to mostly sit in this sporadic realm, meaning this happened by chance, not something that was inherited or can pass along, but happens just in the cells of the eye. So in terms of how the DNA or the genetic code is really um, packaged up and, and contained within our bodies, the chromosomes are what we call structures that are included in every cell of our body. And the chromosomes are really just made up of tightly wound up uh, DNA. And the DNA is basically just a code of four letters that make up um, a succession of instructions to create proteins for the body to function. And those individual proteins are created by units of the DNA called genes. So each gene has a job to do. A gene can be made up of thousands of these codes or dozens. It depends on the gene. But basically, that chromosome structure is what contains all of our genetic information and genes that keep us healthy, protect us, even protect us from cancer. So if you look at uh, chromosomes in, in the human, we have 46 chromosomes in total. We get 23 pairs. You get one from your mom and one from your dad. Males and females all carry the same amount of chromosomes, except for this last pair. Males have an X and a Y chromosome, whereas females have two Xs and no Y chromosome. But the rest of the genetic information contained in the other chromosome is carried by males and females equally. Changes in the amount of chromosomes, we typically refer to them as disomy, trisomy, or monosomy. Disomy in going back to our Latin, uh, would tell us that there are two copies, tri stands for three copies, and mono sounds, stands for one copy. So I introduced this because we talk a little bit about monosomy in some of the genetic testing that we do involving chromosome number three. So if you look at any different type of tumor that, that's advanced and it has obtained a lot of different genetic changes by chance, you can see that some cells can end up quite unhealthy and the chromosomes sort of reflect that. The chromosomes you can see in this advanced breast cancer cell, there's lots and lots of extra, there's missing, there's deletions, duplications, um, fusions or translocations we call them. And we know that that's representative of, of a cell that's had quite a bit of damage, it's not able to regulate how it reproduces. Uveal melanoma cells can also demonstrate chromosomal changes like this, but it's a little simpler in the fact that they tend to only demonstrate changes on four chromosomes, and that's chromosomes one, three, six, and eight. Chromosome number three and chromosome number eight, through all the literature and watching these patients, seem to pose the highest risk for metastasis when they are altered or changed. Typically, we would see chromosome three tends to lose a copy, so we tend to see what we call monosomy three. Chromosome eight can sometimes duplicate a little piece of one of its arms, so it's got an extra piece. And depending on the chromosomal changes in the tumor or combination of chromosomal changes in the tumor, that is associated with a higher risk for 
metastasis based on the genetics of the tumor. It's not the only part of um, the picture that poses an increased risk for metastasis, but it certainly is one of the stronger points. We know that by including not just the genetics of the tumor, but also including what is the age and the gender of the patient, what is the size of the tumor, and the genetics, this multivariant analysis, meaning taking all those things into consideration, is thought to give the most accurate uh, prediction of survivorship or prediction that you'll get a metastasis based on not just the genetics, but the size of the tumor. So for those of you that may have had genetic testing with us um, prior to 2001, we were using a algorithm, the LUMPO algorithm, that allows us to uh, incorporate things like age of the patient, what the gender is, how big is that tumor, and what is the chromosome 3 status. At the time, just chromosome 3 was included in, the, in this algorithm. A tricky part of this older algorithm is that we were required to put in whether there was certain types of cells present in that biopsy, which unfortunately are not always available to us because we do, the doctors do take such a small sample size to conserve that eye. So people that had older reports were, we were able to provide them a, a survivorship prediction by plugging in that yes, there was epithelioid cells there, and then plugging it in again, saying there was no, there wasn't, because we had no way to know. So we offered a range. So you can see that older reports were showing what is the survivorship prediction of that patient, and that means what is the chance that patient will be alive and well in three, five, and ten years from the time of diagnosis. That is compared to a control, so an age and gender matched person. So a person your same age and same gender that doesn't have uveal melanoma, what are their chances they'll be alive and well compared to the patient that has these chromosomal changes? And you can see that there are comparisons of survivorship from a control patient without uveal melanoma to the patient themselves. So this patient has a 57 to 80% chance that they will be alive and well in three years. The control patient, the person without uveal melanoma, has about a 91% chance they'll be alive and well in three years. And that is continued through year five and year seven. The newer LUMPO report um, is actually including the same components, age, gender, size of the tumor, but now we also have a space to add in whether there's any chromosome eight abnormalities as well, and typically a gain or an extra piece of information. The nice thing about this one is that we didn't require the epithelioid cell component to run the algorithm, so we didn't have to offer a range. However, the reporting is a little different. So this is a current sample report, and basically we've altered it a little bit. Our docs wanted to see some more information at the top, but when we talk about the survivorship prediction, it's changed a little bit, and it's sort of separated into the survivorship for that individual patient not necessarily compared to a control population. But in this patient's um, report, you can see the chance that they'll be alive and well at year three, five, and 10 is stated. They also say, what are the chances that you're going to pass away from metastasis due to the, due to the chromosome changes of the tumor and the size and the age of the patient? That is given as a risk for metastasis. There's also a risk there that's given to us just because we're human beings. And whether you're a certain age, you might have a higher risk to pass away just from being human. So that's sort of given to you in a relative state and gives you an individual survivorship. Um, for those of you that perhaps are on this call that had an older report and might want to wish to update that, they're welcome to contact me and we can see if we can reissue the report with the chromosome 8 information in there. And it'll be a little different in terms of the presentation of survivorship, uh, but happy to do that if anyone would like. It's important to remember this is not a perfect science. We know that small tumors with chromosomal changes can result in metastasis. Small tumors with chromosomal changes may not. And the same, large tumors with chromosomal changes can metastasize, but they also don't always metastasize. And that's why 
you know, we really put that back on to your ocular specialist to give you the best course of uh, management and surveillance uh, based on those components, not just of the testing, um, but the uh, but the survivorship prediction. And that is it for me. I will stop sharing. If anyone has questions, uh, please do not ha hesitate to contact me. And um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, great presentations. You'll all agree what uh, wonderful information. I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Crema, Dr. Alcina, and Jamie Jessen for taking time out of their schedules to present their findings to us. Uh, finally, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for attending this symposium today and for being part of this community of ocular melanoma patients and caregivers. It really gives me hope to see so many coming together to learn about this disease. Please don't forget to join us tomorrow at the same time for day two of the symposium. We have a packed day planned with a lot of valuable information coming your way. So I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Goodbye for now. So that concludes our day one. I just want to thank you all before um, I go away. We're going to have some information on the screen about some upcoming events that we have. Um, just a reminder that you will receive an email from Zoom with the day two link. It should be the same one as this one, but you will receive it tomorrow morning. Um, tomorrow we do have presentations by Candace Charles as a patient story. We also have a presentation by Dr. Butler about the metastatic disease, a presentation by uh, of the psychosolo <laughs> um, experience of patients with Monica Tan, and then a open discussion with Nigel Deacon and Kathy Bernard about what patients and caregivers need from Ocumel Canada moving forward. My name is Jasmine. Again, my information is down here. If you have any questions, concerns, or comments that you didn't get answered today and want to connect with certain people that you saw today, please let me know. We're going to leave this screen up for the next 10 minutes, as well as the next one that will show events that are happening in the month of May. Thank you so much for joining us and I will see you guys tomorrow at the same time. Bye-bye.